My name is Ben Chong. I'm a product manager at Google. And as a product manager, I need to set expectations with you all, um, my customers, I guess. Um, there's absolutely no speaker notes here, nothing. So all the bad jokes are all my fault, OK? All right, so I'm going to talk to you about moving your data to cloud. It's actually easier than you think. Um, hopefully, by the end of this, you will believe so. Um, oops. OK, I, I, let me see. Um, so how many of you knew that this was Google's mission? All right, about half, maybe. So like, our mission is to make all the world's information easily accessible right, and useful. Um, this same infrastructure that we, we are using is now available to you right, through Google Cloud. We are basically using the same uh, platform, same applications, making it available as part of the cloud platform uh, product suite. And it allows you to make your company's data available, right, accessible, useful, get value out of that. So here's what you can do right, with your data. Right? You can do um, run some analytics, run some machine learning models on it, create new services, new products out of your data, out of your existing data. Or you can move your applications to the cloud from data center um, and kind of like make it more usable, uh, serve content from cloud. And also, you can just store data on cloud for the long term. We have customers trying to store data or planning to store data in cloud for the next 99 years. Okay. But all these things is possible only if you can get all your data today. Most of the data in, in today's world is in data center, not in cloud. And you, you re realize that it's actually very hard to move data, right? Like, you know, one reason why you're here is that you're thinking that it's really difficult because I, I have a lot of data. I have very little bandwidth. There's a lot of paperwork and red tape I have to go through in order to get like, new network connectivity. How many of you remember seeing, as part of the intro um, slideshow, the note about Evernote? Yeah, so Evernote took about seven months to move a few petabytes of data. They had a pretty large team of people doing that, right? So they basically wrote their own applications with the GCS APIs. So it's, it's, it's kind of tough, um, right? even with the kind of bandwidth that they had. So how you get your data to Google Cloud depends on the kind of data that you have and the kind of data sources. The way we look at the world today is unstructured data, which are files, um, stuff right, on, on object, uh, object or NAS storage devices in your data center, or structured data, generally uh, databases. So the startup we're going to talk about Unstructured data, and for this, I have my uh, colleague Ash, who will cover it. <coughs> Thanks, Ben. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Ash Alawalia, and I'm a product manager that works on large data moves over the network, primarily unstructured data. So one of the first questions that, or first couple of questions you'll need to answer when doing a large unstructured data move are one, how much data are you looking to move? And two, how much bandwidth do you have to move it? So just to get a sense of how, where people land on the spectrum in the room today, how many folks here have a connection to the Google Cloud that is faster than 10 gigabits per second? Faster than 10 GBPS by show of hands? OK, a couple of folks. How many folks have a connection speed that is slower than 1 gigabit per second to Google Cloud? OK, a couple of other folks. How many people have no idea how fast their connection is to the Google Cloud? OK, like 80% of you. So you now know one of the questions that you're going to have to go answer after hearing this talk. So depending on where you are on this spectrum, uh, your transfer can take anywhere from seconds or minutes to days or even weeks. So it's important to understand uh, the answer to these two questions before you start doing a large unstructured data move. Now, this is a pretty complicated graphic. So let me boil it down a little bit. We can keep the y-axis as how much data you're moving. And on the x-axis, instead of bandwidth, let's come up with a, an easier concept to grasp. You can think of this data by how far away it is from GCP. So if you have data that is sitting already inside of GCP, or it's in another public cloud vendor like AWS, there's pretty high bandwidth connections between those public cloud vendors. And so even a moderately large data set can be moved pretty quickly. So in that sense, the data is pretty close to GCP. 
Now, you can think one step further away. Let's say you have an on-prem data center with a typical public uh, uh, connection speed to the public internet. Uh, and then you could even have further afield data centers that are in remote locations or have limited or no, no connection to the internet. In which case, even a small data move is going to take a lot of time. In that sense, it's far from GCP. So what we'll do today is kind of walk through products on different ends of this spectrum and how you can use them for your data move. So we'll start with data that is close to GCP with a product called the Cloud Storage Transfer Service. So this product is explicitly designed to move data from public cloud to GCP, whether that is within GCP from one region to another or from another public cloud like AWS to GCP. Some pretty common use cases for this include people that are archiving or saving a backup copy to GCS as part of their multi-cloud strategy. Some folks pull data from other public clouds into Google Cloud for analysis in a tool like BigQuery. Uh, and then finally, some folks use this tool to move data between GCS regions as part of their daily operations. Now, in addition to pulling data from S3 and GCS, as I've talked about, uh, the Cloud Storage Transfer Service can also pull data uh, from any um, publicly, uh, any data that is publicly addressable on the internet via HTTP. In addition, it supports a one-time transfer or a repeated sync, uh, and is also available in all regions where GCS operates today. So let's do a little bit of a walkthrough of what this service looks like if you actually went to use it. So to find it, you would go into the Cloud Console, and under Google Cloud Storage, there would be an option called Transfer. And if you clicked on that, you would see a summary of all the transfers that are running and are done. And you'd also have the opportunity to start a transfer. To start a transfer, basically, it involves three steps. First, identify the data that you want to move. Second, tell us where you want to move it. And thirdly, tell us when you want to move it. It's just that simple. So I'll walk through an example here. First, identify the data you want to move. So here, hopefully, you guys can see this. I'll point it out to you. Um, you can pick uh, an Amazon S3 bucket and give us the credentials that we need to list objects and pull data from that bucket. And then you can tell us what prefixes to include or exclude. Uh, and you can also use uh, S3 metadata to choose what objects to pull over. Uh, for instance, basing your pull on last modified time. So if you want to only pull objects from S3 that have been modified in the last week, you can do that. The second step is to figure out where to move this data. Uh, and to do that, you can pick essentially any GCS bucket, and we support all GCS storage classes. Finally, uh, you, go, you have to tell us when you want to move it. Now, you have basically two, two options here. One is to just move it right now, uh, or you can schedule a daily sync at a time of your choosing. So for instance, if you have a workload on AWS that writes new objects to S3 every day, you can schedule a transfer job to run every night at midnight to sync those over to GCS. So that's a little bit about the Cloud Storage Transfer Service. Now, the next step on this uh, larger graphic here is if you have a, um, a presence in a colo or even on-premise data center that has good connectivity to the internet. In that case, uh, we offer a product called GSUtil that you can use to push your data to GCS. GSUtil is a command line utility that is specifically designed to help you push data from a data center that you are operating into GCP. And because it's a command line utility, you can use it for your manual workflows or as part of a script. You can also run it in a background process where it's constantly syncing files and directories to a GCS bucket of your choosing. Now, in addition to the sync and copy options we talked about, GSUtil also operates in a streaming mode. So if you have a process that's long running and outputs data periodically, you can pipe that output to GSUtil, and it will push it along to GCS. GCS, has, GCS Util has a lot of options. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll highlight a couple. It automatically retries if it encounters ephemeral network errors or errors from GCS. It also supports customer-managed and customer-supplied encryption keys. Uh, and finally, it, it obeys the object versioning semantics that are typical of most GCS clients. So let's talk a little bit about some of the uh, questions that come up when people use GS Util. The first one is, how do I move my data quickly? So there are a couple of features that GSUtil has to help you do this. The first is using multi-threading. So you can use the dash M flag to uh, ensure that the GSUtil process is running multiple threads, which are pulling all of your files in parallel and pushing them to GCS. 
Now, if that's not fast enough to fill up your bandwidth to GCP, you can also split up and run GSUtil on multiple hosts. Uh, and by doing so, uh, move your data in parallel across multiple GSUtil processes and use up more of your bandwidth. Now, to do that, one th important thing to note is that you'll have to manually partition your data in advance so that um, uh, none of these separate GSUtil processes are stomping on one another. Now, let's say uh, you did that. One of the problems you may encounter, especially if you're moving a large set of files, is that there's one file and one, one GSUtil thread and one process moving it. So if you have a really large file, like a 100 gigabyte file, you might sit there waiting for that thread to move byte by byte for that really large file, and it just takes too long. So to address that situation, GSUtil has a feature called parallel composite uploads. What it does is it basically takes large files, breaks them into chunks, and moves all of those chunks simultaneously to GCS. Once they arrive at GCS, those chunks are now composited into a single GCS object. It does require a little bit of setup. You have to set some environment variables and compile a, a library for CRC mod uh, for the host where GSUtil is installed. Uh, in addition, it is important to note that if you are using uh, certain storage classes for GCS, it does incur additional cost as these uh, composite pieces are put together. So a couple of other assorted questions that come up when people are using GSUtil. The first is, how do I control how much bandwidth it's using? For instance, if I already have workloads in my data center, I don't want GSUtil to use up all the bandwidth that those workloads need to use. So how do I stop that? Unfortunately, today, GSUtil does not have native support for bandwidth throttling. But you can use tools like Trickle or uh, your network, um, network administration controls to control how much bandwidth GSUtil uses. Another question that comes up is how do I preserve my metadata, especially if I'm trying to do use GCS or GSUtil uh, to make a backup of my data onto GCS? And to do that, you can use the dash P option, which takes your file metadata, your POSIX file metadata, and puts it into the metadata of the GCS objects as you copy them over. Finally, some folks are concerned about overriding data that already exists in the GCS bucket. If you're concerned about that, you can use the dash N option, which ensures that you do not clobber any data that already exists. So these are a couple of little tools and tricks that you can use with GSUtil. There's actually a lot more to read and understand uh, before we become an expert on this. So before I hand it back to Ben, uh, I just want to highlight three things that I covered off on today. One, whenever you're doing a large transfer, think about how much data you need to move and how much bandwidth you have to move it. Secondly, take a look at some of the features we walked through today and some of our extensive documentation on these two products to figure out how, which features make the most sense for the data you're trying to move. And thirdly, and most importantly, in my opinion, whenever you're doing a large transfer, always start with a small sample of the data that you intend to move so you understand what features make sense for you, how much it's going to cost, and how long it's going to take. With that, let me hand it back to Ben to talk about the furthest end of the spectrum when you have a remote data center with limited bandwidth or no connection to the internet at all. Thanks, Thanks Ash. All right, so what if you are in a situation where you have very low bandwidth, or even if you have bandwidth, a lot of it is taken up by uh, other workloads, uh, or you are in a situation where there's no network at all, right? So this is what we call offline transfers. So for that, we have Google Transfer Appliance. Right? This is the, uh, the first hardware product that the Google Cloud is shipping. Um, how many of you have been to Moscone West and seen it in person? Just uh, less than a handful. So we actually have a real appliance out in Moscone West in the showcase floor uh, that you can actually touch. It's a real appliance. It has all 60 drives in it. Um, so this is a high-capacity storage server that we ship to customers. And the idea is that you will load your data onto the appliance, ship it back to us. We upload it for you. I want to focus on the use cases, right? Because there is, um, you know, when we talk to customers, a lot of customers start thinking about interconnect and so on and so forth, um, or upgrading your network bandwidth. And we know that there's a complicated uh, process, right? There's the budget, there is uh, availability, and so on and so forth. Some, a lot of ISPs want you to commit to a two-year period. 
uh, and then your CIO comes to you and says, hey, I want to try out this machine learning stuff, uh, but I do not want to invest in you know, high bandwidth networks. So what, what do you do, right? We have had good, relatively good customer success where we ship them a, a TA100, which is a 100 terabyte um, appliance. They load it with 40 to 70 terabytes of data, ship it back to us. And then with that amount of data, they can actually run a you know, pretty good uh, machine learning modeling exercise. Right? And after that, they're happy enough that they, they sign on with us for the long term. So this is really good for, for POCs. You are not blocked by the availability of network or interconnect, all that kind of conversations with the ISPs. Um, another use case is where customers decide that, look, they want to um, end of life their on-prem storage. Right? Um, and then they want to move all that data to cloud. This is really good for that. So we, we ship them this, like the, the big one that, that you see there, uh, load it with all the data, ship it back to us. And we, we saw it in GCS, generally core line or near line for the long term. Um, how many of you have seen our blog where we talk about the Schmidt Ocean Institute? You know? So believe it or not, like, there are data centers on ships. Right, so this customer of ours, they go on a cruise uh, for about a month or so. They actually take the smaller appliance and they rack it in the ship. There's actually a data center in the ship. They collect all the data. When, and while they're collecting data, they're, they're syncing it to the appliance. So once they reach port, they ship it back to us. And then we load it to GCS and then they share it with the rest of the researchers right, worldwide. Um, and then we have customers, and, and this is the last use case, right? monthly longer uh, batches of data. So we have customers with also like, um, you know, poor uh, networks or insufficient networks, and then they use this for that. Now, transfer appliance is available in the US today. Right? We are generally available. We announced it about a month ago. Um, we are starting a pilot program in the EU. So it's uni European Union for you. Um, so like, how many European customers are there here? All right, cool. So like, feel free to reach back out to me, or you can sign up with the link here. Uh, we'll reach back out to you and get you started once we kick off that process. And it's going to be in a couple of weeks. All right, so like, quick summary of the onboarding process. You go to Pantheon Cloud, sorry, Cloud Console to you guys, uh, request an appliance. We send it to you. You configure it, set it up, fill it with data, ship it back to us. We do the painful stuff of uploading data for, for you. And then the last step, you decrypt your data and move it to the location or the storage class that you, you want the, your data to reside in the long term. And then the appliance after the data has been uploaded, we wipe it securely. Um, common questions include, OK, what, what do you do, right? Beyond wiping, we wipe, we repartition the hard drives, reformat the hard drives, reinstall the OS in case our customers decide to install some application on it. Because we have heard, oh, we are running Linux on it. OK, I'm going to install some, some tools, but no, no, no. So we reinstall the OS, reinstall the application, and then get it ready for the next customer. So essentially, the next customer will get uh, a new appliance. All right, so I'm going to walk through like what Ash did, um, the overall uh, appliance experience. There you can see in uh, Cloud Console, if you go to the Storage tab, there's an option now for Transfer Appliance. Fill up the form here. Um, it's good to know like, how much data you want to move. And please don't submit multiple times, because we process all these things manually, so it's kind of fun to see like, you know, some customers. If I hit Submit more often, we'll get more, more appliances. Uh, we'll work with you. There's actually a person at the end of this. So we'll work with you to ship you the right appliances. Um, and again, there's another person, there's a person at the end of this, so you know, we'll work with you, right? So it's not a machine that is going to shut you down and end of three days kind of thing. It's, it's a real person, and, and we'll make sure that you, you get the best support that you, you need. Um, this is a picture of the back of the appliance, and you can see the real thing uh, in Moscone West. You can see there's the standard power supply connectors. We have fiber optic ports here, four of them. We will supply the transceivers, should you need transceivers. There are four copper Ethernet ports. Now, why, why do we have four? This allows you to do network aggregation, right? So you can run at a throughput of 40 gigs per second, right, of throughput. So that networking itself is no longer the, the limiting factor for you to capture data onto the appliance. Now, we have customers where the internal network is only one gig. 
by running it at four at a time, we are able to achieve uh, four gigabits per second, which is not too bad, uh, and allows them to capture data quickly enough. Okay. Um, this is where we talk about encryption. Uh, so the data is encrypted in transit. We use AES-256. There's no phone home at all. Uh, the appliance is completely uh, disconnected from Google Cloud. The key is generated by you guys, right? So you, as part of this setting setup, you type in your, uh, or create a password, passphrase that's used to generate the key. The encryption key is stored in RAM on, on the appliance. So while you're capturing data, you know, the key is being used. Once you power off the appliance to ship it back to us, the key is gone. Um, when you re, what, what we call rehydrate, which is kind of decrypting the data, that is done within your project. So that's, uh, and, and we don't have access to it. All right. So we provide a web-based UI. You connect to the appliance using a web browser. Today, we support Chrome. Um, don't ask me why. Um, and you can see the job status, the available physical capacity, as well as network usage. So you know something is happening there. We offer a few capture options. So the first two uh, options, Linux Capture Utility and Windows Capture Utility, are for situations where you need to do a, a fair amount of authentication to access your data sources. right? Um, in that situation, you will have other Windows workstation or Linux workstation sitting between your data source and the transfer appliance. And the capture utility will read data from the data source and push it to the transfer appliance. Mount NFS share is essentially where the appliance is able to mount or where you allow the appliance to mount your uh, data sources. And it will pull the, the data from the data source. And the last option there, which is uh, new and which is pretty popular because it's is an easy concept. It's where the appliance itself can be configured to be um, a NAS box, right? So you can mount it through NFS and just copy your rsync data to it. And it's a very easy, uh, easy thing to do there. So again, this is um, a screenshot that shows a couple of uh, options uh, in pro progress. So the first option there, you can see NFS client. That's where the appliance is acting as an NFS client reading data from a NAS box. And the second option there uh, is that we have exposed part of the appliance as an NFS share. All right, so once you have captured data onto the appliance, you ship it to us. Um, this is actually the box that you see in Moscone West. Uh, and we upload it to a Google bucket. So the final step is rehydration. That's where you will uh, run uh, a VM, a GC VM in your GCP project. Uh, this way you will decrypt the, the data and move it to the uh, GCP bucket, uh, GCS bucket of, of your choice in the region of your choice. So we don't control uh, where you move your data. For example, you can decide to, you have data in the US, you want to move it to a European bucket you can still run the appliance uh, process, and then uh, when you decrypt the, the data, it can be stored into the GCS bucket in Europe. Um, and this is a screenshot of the UI with the rehydration jobs running. And finally, when, it, when all is said and done, we provide a summary dialog uh, that tells you how much data was transferred, number of files. We will highlight failures, like you know, sometimes files are missed because either they are deleted while being captured or there are some integrity failures. Integrity is where we do a checksum, right? So the source file, destination file, we do a CRC32, and we'll tell you if a bit has been flipped. Um, so we are working with a bunch of partners uh, for transfer appliance. So here's one use case where um, you're using Commvault to back up your data, right? But the first initial corpus of backup data can be so large that it's not feasible to transfer it over the network. So we use the transfer appliance as a backup target. Back up the transfer appliance, we upload that initial uh, backup corpus into a GCS bucket, and then you will do the deltas over the network. So we're working with another partner, Cohesity, for a very similar use case as well. All right, so this is kind of like a summary of uh, our own um, solutions for data transfers. Partner solutions. So Google is very partner friendly. Um, 
For online data transfers, we have partner options from Trivella, Espera, Bitspeed, and Comprise. And for offline options, like if you have too little data, there's you know, too little data for transfer appliance because the smallest appliance is about 100 terabytes. What if you have about five terabytes of data? You can work with Iron Mountain to ship the drives to them. Or a lot of customers have data already stored on hard drives. Um, they can ship the hard drives to Iron Mountain as well. Okay. Um, and this is another interesting use case where if you were to have active data sets that are changing all the time, you may not want to freeze the data sets or your workflow just because you want to move data to through transfer appliance or through other means. So with Zara Storage, you can basically take a snapshot of data, move it to the cloud, and then sync um, at the back end. All right, so this is a summary of um, transfer options for unstructured data. So let's talk about structured data next. This next sec section is very, um, very quick section. We will cover databases, data lake, uh, BigQuery. And this is basically going to just give you an idea of what's available. I'm not going to go into too much depth here. And you'll see a lot of logos flow by. And, and that's because a lot of it is true partner solutions. So database migration, um, what we are saying here is that it's not just about the data. right? There's a few things you need to think about. The migration of the data and schema is just one of it. Um, database assessment, data discovery, um, the migration itself, and then there's the app logic migration, because no database lives by itself. We're just going to cover data discovery and data schema migration here. Um, this is a redirection slide. Uh, so where you can do data discovery with Informatica, that's who we are partnering with. They actually have a session um, after this where they will cover uh, what they can do here. All right, so the whole point of data discovery is finding out what you have. Uh, we, we find that uh, since the, the start of cloud, you find that a lot of you know, teams in IT departments, they kind of start cloud products or pro cloud projects. And the CIO or the rest of the company may, know, may not know what's out there. So the idea here is to find out what you have so you can kind of figure out what you need to do, what you need to migrate over. Um, here we talk about data schema migration right, to Spanner and Cloud SQL. So we, again, we have a bunch of partners that can migrate data um, and the schemas uh, from different sources out there. Now, if you are looking at uh, creating a data lake on GCP, uh, GCS with Dataproc, the session up there is over, uh, but we, uh, all the sessions are videotaped, so you guys can, can watch that online. So again, we have partners there to help you move data from either HDFS um, or other cloud object storage to, to GCS for use with Dataproc. BigQuery is, again, you know, a bunch of... Uh, third-party logos here. Um, again, th this will highlight that, that Google is actively partnering with a lot of uh, other companies to, to provide solutions to our customers right? as you think about leveraging clouds, as you think about doing a lift and shift to cloud for, for existing workloads. And finally, this is a, a Google product, a BigQuery, a data transfer service. So a lot of um, marketeers are, are using right, the products you see on the left here. Um, for marketing campaigns and so on. And BigQuery is a great tool to figure out like, what customers are actually doing. Right? How are they, are they clicking? How are they reacting with the, interacting with the ads? Uh, are they actually falling through? Um, and, and because you have different data sources, BigQuery is a good way of combining all of them, joining the data sets and getting some intelligence out of it. All right, so that's the end of the presentation.